Hello and welcome to this episode of the Psychology Book Club. Today we are talking about the book Why Love Matters by Sue Gerhardt. My name is Hannah and I am joined by Jake today. Hello. So Jake, to begin with, what was your general impression of this book? I liked it. I found it to be quite useful, um, especially because we have just had a baby. We have a 10-month-old daughter and... The subject matter is very relevant for for us at the moment. I think I took really three major things from this book that the whole rest of the book was pretty much about and and was more of an elaboration of these three basic points that she made, which were that babies are incredibly vulnerable and especially if they don't have enough care from their parents. Uh, It's an incredibly uh, stressful time. And the second point was that stress damages this baby's long term and leads to all sorts of of, uh, mental and emotional problems if babies encounter that stress. And the third point was that love and the right kind of care can protect babies from that kind of damage. And essentially what I took is this book is essentially a long elaboration of those three basic core arguments. Yes, I should have said at the beginning of this podcast, the basic premise of the book is that childhood and especially infanthood experiences fundamentally impact and shape the brain and have a lasting impact on not only our individual lives, but also society, because obviously we were all kids at some point. And um, the parenting that we received really matters, as you were saying, you know, it actually has a physiological effect on the brain. And that's what this book is about. I also really liked it. I thought it was a great mixture of it's sort of a combination of neuroscience, psychology, and then I would say some some parenting advice in there. Um, I also found it useful listening to it as a new-ish parent. There was definitely it was definitely a little stressful at times because it made me realise just how much impact you you have on your child. I mean, I knew that before, but it really brought it home in a very tangible way. Just how important being responsive in the first few years, especially, is and the amount of damage, frankly, that you can do as a parent if you're not responsive. But it was also very useful to read about that and to be reminded of just how important it is to be responsive and also to read more about what responsiveness looks like and what that actually means. Yeah, and you mentioned the first few years. One thing that just I remembered while you were saying that is that she has some interesting findings in there about even the first few months being really crucial I think there's a study that she mentions to do with, um, I believe it was the Romanian baby study, but mm. uh, babies that were in Romanian orphanages where they received just brutal lack of care. And I think it, those babies that were adopted after four months, even if they were adopted into homes where they received a lot of the right kind of care, they, their cortisol levels never really uh, sort of went back to normal if you like compared to the ones some of the ones that were adopted before four months um i think as far as i remember did um adapt to a normal life a bit better so as well as the first few years being really important i got the message from this that even the first few months is really crucial Definitely. And my sense from reading around this topic is that people are starting to become more and more aware of this. And you now have movements like attachment parenting, which is touted as this really new thing. And it's not. It's how people in other cultures have been parenting for since forever, basically, where their babies just attach them the whole time and they co-sleep. And you know, it's it's not an unusual thing for them, whereas it very much is still in Western culture. And it's the kind of approach that would definitely raise a few eyebrows because we do have this, I think we still do have this cultural attitude that maybe not so much in the newborn stage, but certainly at some point you have to start teaching your child that they've got to spend time on their own, that they've got to, you know, be able to entertain themselves, that you can't be at their beck and call. Spoiling is a word that comes up a lot. You know, you mustn't spoil your baby. I, I've certainly been told that, that if I pick my daughter up when she cries, I'm spoiling her and she's never going to learn how to soothe herself. And I should just put her down sometimes and leave her even if she cries. And that's not advice I'm following because what I read and what I agree with, like what my instinct tells me and what's sort of backed up by the research in this book is that you can't spoil a baby. There's just no, that's not a thing that can happen. They have fundamental needs and your job as a parent is to meet those needs. 
Um, and so, you know, when, when they cry, for example, it's a sign that they are hungry or too hot or too cold or tired or they just want to cuddle or they're not feeling well. There's always a reason for it. It's not necessarily a reason that you can immediately fix at that time, for example, if they're teething, but there is going to be a reason there. Yeah, I remember she makes the point in the book at, at some point that people often imagine that in order for you to be self-sufficient and kind of be a self-starter, you have to kind of learn discipline at some stage. And that if you want your child to learn discipline, you then you need to kind of push them away to a certain extent and make them have independence. And she ma- it makes the point that the counterintuitive thing with babies is that actually it's only if you have a secure base, it's only if you have the care and the love and the attention as a baby that you are able then to grow away from your parents and because you, you've you've got that secure base so you're able to be more self-sufficient and independent right you need to learn how to be dependent first before you can then become independent yeah or at least you need to be cared for in that very vulnerable stage where you are totally dependent so that you're not under stress i mean this is the kind of the argument as far as i understand it that Babies, because it's a life or death matter, they instinctively know that if they're not getting the right attention from their parents and especially their mother, if they're not getting the right attention, they might not get fed. And if they don't get fed in time, they could starve, they could die, as so many millions of babies have done in our evolutionary history. And so they kind of instinctively know this is a life or death situation, which is super stressful for them. So that period of dependency in order for them to kind of get through it without being traumatized by it and just totally stressed out, they need the love and, and, and care during that dependency stage. And then if you get that, you grow up healthy and you can, you go out and be independent. Absolutely. And I, I think it's, it's not right for me to say you have to learn to be dependent. That's not the right way of putting it. It's that you have to have the experience of it being safe to be dependent right. and to be able to be dependent and have your needs met in order to then go out and be independent. And as you know, as most of us know, and probably if you're listening to this bit club, you're probably aware that, you know, attachment is a big issue for people. And generally the attachment patterns that you develop in childhood tend to play out again and again and again in your relationships. And so it is so, so important. We actually did a secure base for the book club a few, if several years ago now, I'm not sure if it's actually on the podcast, but we, we talked about that. And one of the things that I liked about this book is it builds on that because she talks about attachment, but she also talks about some of the other effects that childhood care or infanthood care can have on us as well. For example, the very real effects it can have on our amygdalas, right? This part of our brain that controls fight or flight response. Um, She also talks about, as you just mentioned, cortisol levels and the cortisol response that we can develop as a result of, and this goes all the way through to adulthood, as a result of these experiences that we had. Um, And something that I personally found really interesting was she talks about how when we don't have our feelings mirrored back to us in a way that makes sense you know that that accurately affects what we're feeling and accepts what we're feeling we people can develop this this sort of disconnect between the right hemisphere and the left hemispheres of the brain and that that can affect our sense of emotional security as adults because it leaves us less able to form a coherent story about our, our personal narratives i thought that part was really interesting yeah there's a lot of um very interesting findings from neuroscience that she summarizes i mean i don't think she's a scientist and so it's sort of an outsider view of the scientific literature but she summarizes kind of for for the lay person what the basic findings are and what i took from it is that essentially in early childhood in well as babies there are so many neural pathways being developed and being in little connections being made that are going to be vital for the rest of your life and setting you up for the rest of your life that if you're under extreme stress because you're not getting the attention and care and love that you need then those pathways get don't develop properly and then you get it's much harder to develop normal psychological well-being and normal mental functioning if you if you've been through that as a baby and that affects you in in all sorts of ways either you are essentially over nervous and and you have that kind of uh, sort of continually stressed response or 
you get the opposite effect, which is that you become kind of deadened to, to your emotions and it becomes much harder to connect with them. Yeah, that made a lot of sense to me, that part. And by the way, I just look it up and see Gerhardt is a psychotherapist. So she's not a psychologist. She's coming at this, like you said, from an outsider's perspective. But um, I was, she sounds like a psychologist. I mean, I was really impressed by the amount of research she's obviously done into this topic. She knows what she's talking about. Oh, yeah, no, I meant she's not, uh, she's not a scientist from in the, in the neuroscience field because she's coming from it more from the therapy side. All uh, right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I thought the cortisol point was really, really interesting because obviously as adults, we all encounter stress, right? It's just a part of life. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting how she described how these these experiences we have lead us to create one of three stress responses. There's the robust stress response, which is what we would probably describe as a healthy stress response, where we tend to be, you know, obviously think we feel stress. We are susceptible to becoming stressed out, especially by major life events and, you know, tragedies or, you know, whatever happens. Um, however, we are generally quite resilient in the face of stress. Um, and then she talks about the two, I guess, less healthy or the two um, deviations from the robust stress response, which you just mentioned, one is the low cortisol response and one is the high cortisol response. I think she calls them high reactor and low reactor and high reactor. But I thought it was, and I wanted to ask you about this because I know when we were talking about, um, we were talking about this part of the book as we were reading it, you were a little skeptical, but I thought it was very interesting how she connected. Um, I think it was, it was either the, I think it was the low reactor, the low cortisol response to, she said, obviously both types you know can be prone to certain mental illnesses like depression and things like that but low reactors in particular i think she mentioned that they tend to be susceptible to certain types of cancers what did you think about that yeah i wondered about that and you're right i, I was a bit skeptical because i always whenever people talk about diseases like cancer being essentially something that you control with your mind i kind of wonder whether or not that is getting a little bit um, unscientific and, and I, I don't know enough about the data to really know how much cancer is a is affected by your psychological state so I'm just a bit skeptical because I'm I, I don't really understand the field well enough and it sounds a little bit like oh it's all in the it's all in the mind type of thing whereas I, I think there are biological processes that you may not be able to link to the way that someone's mental well-being is going you know what i mean but i do think it's i do think that your psychological and mental states have obviously huge effects on your physical well-being and your physical health so i'm not totally against the idea i just don't know quite how um what well based in science that idea is yeah i know what you're talking about i think maybe where you're coming from is um have you heard of louise hay and you can heal your life no. Oh, okay. That's quite a new, it's a, basically a new age book that is very um, popular in a lot of personal growth circles. That's the word I was looking for. New it age. sounds new agey. It sounds kind of new agey to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it is a new agey, this idea. Um, I'm I'm not a huge fan of it myself. And I, I, full disclosure, I haven't read Louise Hay's book. This is just what I've heard about it from other people, which might not be very accurate. But um, in general, I, as far as I'm aware, there is this kind of school of thought that basically if you are sick, you can heal yourself, you know, even cancer through um, and really serious diseases like that through essentially thinking more positively and letting go of, you know, toxic feelings like shame and guilt and just loving yourself basically that's a very very simplified explanation of what i think <laughs> what i think they're trying to say but um i i don't like that because the implication that i get from that is that if you have cancer it's your fault and i think that is such a that is a toxic message to send to someone because as you said there's so many reasons why people come down with cancer autoimmune diseases you know things that really affect their quality of life and potentially are even terminal and i i think it's it's pretty brutal to suggest to anyone that they caused it well, I mean, the main issue is that it's not true. I mean, it would be nice if you could think your way out of cancer, but that just, at least that is not supported by the evidence. People don't think their way out of it. And so, you know, it, I think that's the problem I have with it is that I, I th that new agey type idea doesn't seem to be correct as mm. far as I understand. 
As yeah, and as far as I'm aware, though, there is some truth in the idea that stress, while maybe it can't cause cancer, it can make it can definitely make you more susceptible to illness because stress causes inflammation. It doesn't your immune response. And when I when I was reading the book, that's more how I interpreted what she was saying. I didn't interpret it as she was joining the kind of new age clique and saying having a low cortisol response means, you know, that that's what causes the cancer, but it is a contributing factor in that it, it causes inflammation within the body and it can deaden immune response as well. That makes total sense to me that when you're under stress, it, it weakens your immune, immune response and you're also devoting a lot of energy to producing cortisol and being ever having ever, all your systems on high alert and she she does explain that whole process quite well that while you're doing that your body can't be getting on with all of the normal day-to-day maintenance and general healthy growth that you need to do and mm-hmm. consequently that does mean that you're going to be really sort of running without maintenance so to speak and, and then you're going to get ill right and i think this is particularly if she flags this particularly as an issue for low I keep forgetting the names of these, low reactors, because high reactors have a high cortisol response, but my my sense from what, the way she described it is that they can release that. You know, they, they panic, they get stressed about things, even though the bar for them becoming stressed and panicked about things is very, very low. They at least have an emotional release for that, whereas the thing with low reactors is that they have a flattened cortisol response, and so usually they just don't react at all, and they might not even consciously feel anything but then they're storing all these feelings up and storing them up. Um, and she describes how, you know, eventually it leads to an angry outburst or them just totally losing their temper, temper with no warning whatsoever. And that's, that's the low reactor response. And that, that's, it's that kind of deadening that makes them more, more prone to certain illnesses. Right, right. But I think also the, the highly nervous types, um, again, that, that takes a toll on the body too, just Definitely. being stressed out all, the whole time. And the basic point of the book is that if you don't get the, the love that you need in those first months, then it leads to all these problems later. So parenting is crucial, especially in the very early uh, months of, baby, of a baby's life, but also um, in the first years of childhood. And she mentions, for example the problems that daycare causes um, for children that even though I think there was some study that she mentioned that even though children seem to be okay and seem to be getting on fine in daycare those kids that didn't have really uh, consistent contact and bonding with an adult during the day uh, were showing high levels of cortisol they were stressed and so it was having an effect on them. Yeah, that was something I thought was really interesting. And I've read this before as well from different books about things like crying it out and, quote, training children or babies especially how to sleep. Um, and she talks about crying it out in this book and how, again, it's not, it's not a good thing to do, especially with babies, um, because there's, there are reasons they're waking up and just because, you know, the, the idea the idea behind crying it out is that you are training the baby to self-soothe. And the point that she makes in this book, as we've already touched on, is that you you train, or I, I use that word very loosely, you teach children, you model how to self-soothe by soothing them first off. And then they internalize that ability to soothe. And she says that what happens with things like cry out, and I think similar to what you're talking about with daycare as well, is that children ostensibly works in that babies stop crying and they go to sleep. Um, but, and this is what I've read elsewhere as well, that just because they're crying doesn't mean they're not stressed. They're still stressed. It's just they're, they're not showing it. They have what's called learned helplessness now because what they learn from that is no one's coming when they cry. And so what's the point in expending the energy crying? But they're still unhappy, right? Just because they're quiet doesn't mean everything's okay. Um, and I think that's the same point that you're making with daycare as well, which is that just because the kids seem fine doesn't mean they actually are. Yeah, they're basically having a stressful lifestyle that is going to have long-term effects on the way that their brains develop. I mean, that's the central argument of the book. And I think it's a, a very important topic and it's it's really vital to invest the time as a parent, if you if you do want to have kids, to invest the time early so that your kids then have the opportunity to build all of those neural pathways and get everything 
set up right for, for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. And obviously not everyone is always in a position to have one person at home or whatever, but I think to the extent that you can, it's really good to try and um, maximize secure attachment time and consistent caregiving and so on. Yeah, I think the, the main point is you can't fit kids in as a side project. They require so much love and attention in order for their lives to to be set up for a healthy healthy growth. And the reason is because, and this I think helped me empathize with kids and, and especially with babies. Uh, this book really helped me empathize. The reason is because it is an incredibly stressful time being a baby. I mean, you, it's a life or death situation and you instinctively know it. And so you are super stressed and we just think, oh, babies are crying all the time and crying at night and, and sort of being an inconvenience. As adults, we think that. For the baby, this is life or death. That's what it feels like to them. And so you can't just kind of fit kids around your own schedule. If you want to have kids, you've really got to take it as a, a major commitment because that's what they need. Yeah. And she makes the point that emotional behavior is always a response to other people and that when we develop emotional intelligence that happens in the context of other relationships and that's especially true for it's true for adults but it's especially true for infants and i think she makes the key time she says for that in particular is years two and three right that's when some of the more social skills are really getting laid down yeah absolutely so was there anything else that you wanted to say about this book i mean the one thing i would say is that it is it's a long book fairly long book and it's also quite complex there's a lot of information in there i think it's a book that's worth reading a couple of times really just to let everything sink in so it's when we when i was thinking about this conversation I was thinking it's it's pretty hard actually to have a conversation about this book for this book club without skipping over a lot of stuff that's in the book just because it is it goes into so much detail um and it's it's interesting it's very specific and detailed about the neuroscience and the psychology of it um, so I, I would really recommend checking it out. Yeah, there are a lot of examples and studies are summarized and so forth. But I think ultimately the, the message, all of those examples are supporting a pretty straightforward message. Like I was saying in the beginning, it's a stressful time to be a baby. And it's especially stressful if parents are not giving them enough attention. And if they are under stress for a long time, that has all these massive long-term implications for their mental and physical well-being and basically you've got to be there for them otherwise uh, they won't their brains won't develop properly and she goes into all these different studies to kind of explain that but that's essentially the point of the book i think it is worth reading especially if you're a parent i mean it's super interesting to read um, because it's it's very relevant for us at the moment but i think it's also interesting even if you're not a parent to think about your own childhood and to think about you know the effects of uh, things that you experienced on your life and and also for other people that, that you know to think about their childhoods and how it can affect them definitely and you know to clarify i think she's not saying you have to be the perfect parent obviously because that does not exist and she does make the point as well that it's not for example when she's talking about disapproval and how parents communicate the many different ways parents can communicate disapproval to children she says it's not the disapproval the experience of disapproval that counts it's the recovery afterwards so it's not experiencing disapproval that is going to cause all these problems later on but it's whether you can experience disapproval and then recover from it later mm. something else i also found really helpful was you know when we talk about responsiveness she she hones in on it's not just about responding to your baby it's about responding with the right thing so for example if they're hungry responding with food if they're tired responding by helping them get to sleep you know and so on not just like, weaving a toy in their face and hoping that that's enough or something like that and I, I think that is a really important point as well because that can be really hard sometimes I mean you know obviously I, I think our daughter's pretty good at communicating what she wants um she's she's always been pretty patient with us as well but it's really hard sometimes to to work out, to work out what's going on because obviously she can't say, "Hey, I'm kind of hungry right now," or you know, actually, I really feel like I need to take a nap. It's it's almost like a process of elimination sometimes. Yeah, but that makes total sense to me in the context of mirroring feelings and validating their experience, right? Because if you are just throwing all this random stuff 
into the mix, which I mean, sometimes you have to do to figure out what's going on. But if, if that's sort of the general way that you're operating, then you, you know, trying to empathize with the kid's point of view, you can see how they experience that as like, my parents don't understand me basically, or, you know, my, my mother doesn't get me. Like she's not, she's not attuned to me. Is that word attunement? I think so. I mean, there is a general level of stress from them not being able to, to, communicate the need their needs always in a way that is going to be understood but i think if they they i'm sure there's a big difference between the experience for a baby of trying to communicate and experiencing the language barrier and trying to communicate and having a kind of a parent who's mentally checked out you know is not really engaged in the process yeah. or you know what she talks about a lot more in this book is just having parents who aren't around that much if she, if the baby if if a baby is with in daycare and with babysitters and with other people, just not having that connection, that bond. Yeah. Did you have anything else that you wanted to say? No, I think that was it. I, th- I think it was a, an interesting read, especially as I say, if you're a parent, but even if you're not, I, w- I think it's worthwhile having a look at it. I echo that a hundred percent. And I, I think I actually read this book for the first time. Oh gosh, I don't even know several years ago now. And it it made a big impression on me then, which is why I wanted to circle back to it for this book club. And it made a big impression on me this time around as well, obviously in a very different context this time, because I am a parent now. I wasn't then. It was more from a personal interest perspective and interest in counseling and psychology then. But yeah, it was, I definitely got different things out of it reading it this time as a parent, but I would say it's one of those books that even though it's about parenting, everyone was a child at some point. So I think it is one of those books that wherever you are in your life and, you know, whatever your, your plans or intentions or wishes are around children or not children, you know, whatever the case is, it's probably, it is probably something that you're going to get some good stuff out of. So just to finish up, I wanted to share, I think it's one of the last paragraphs of the book, um, because I think it's, it's a nice summary of what she's saying here. And, um, it's a nice call to action as well. So she says the qualities of good parenting and of close relationships in general are essentially regulatory qualities, the capacity to listen, to notice, to shape behavior, and to be able to restore good feelings through some kind of physical, emotional, or mental contact through a touch, a smile, a way of putting feelings and thoughts into words. These capacities are personal ones, but they cannot be expressed fully in a culture which relegates children to the margins. To be able to notice and respond to others' feelings takes up time. It requires a kind of mental space to be allocated to feelings and a willingness to prioritize relationships. This is a challenge to a goal-orientated society. And I think that's really true. That's definitely been my experience, not only of, you know, what what is the regulatory aspect of it. I feel like that's actually been most of our job so far. But I also, as a parent, I've noticed more than I ever noticed before just how, um, as a culture, I think we do sort of treat children like, like you said, like these little side projects. You know, I'm not saying parents don't love their children. I think, you know, parents do love their children um, for the most part, more than anything in this world. But I, I, I think we, we have this general kind of cultural attitude towards children, which that there's something to kind of... There's something that people do, but then you try and sort of fit them around your old life. Maybe that's not a fair assessment, but I, I notice it especially with things like work and so on. You know, there's, there's, I think there is a lot of pressure in society these days. For example, have a baby and then go back to work as soon as possible, um, when actually that's not the best thing for the mother or the child a lot of times. Yeah, and that's one of the most useful things about this book is to explain why you can't treat kids as a side project and why it's so important to... You have to give them the time that they need. And otherwise, you know, you don't have to have kids. You can just choose not to have kids. But if you want to do it, then uh, they deserve the getting the care and love that they need because otherwise their brains don't develop properly. And that is why love matters. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a great book. I hope you will check it out. Thanks a lot for listening today. And we'll be back with another episode soon. Bye. Bye.